Hello and welcome to the Donahue Group. We're coming uh, to you the uh, day after the mayoral and city elections and uh, the April elections in general in Sheboygan. And uh, uh, we'll go around and just say who we are. Uh, uh, we'll start with my friend Cal Potter. Cal Potter, I'm pleased to be here. And uh, this is our, what, our third taping. Yes. And uh, we're pleased to have one of the winning candidates with us today. That's We've uh, made a point of trying to follow local politics extensively, and this is going to be a real pleasure to see one of the winners. Exactly, and we'll know who he is. Tom? Uh, Tom Paneski uh, at UW Sheboygan, uh, mathematics uh, professor and uh, former alderman, city, former city alderman. We're going to skip over our special guest and our next panelist. I'm Ken Risto. I'm an employee of the Sheboygan Area School District and the only one who's got a bad cold here this afternoon. So. And well, the only, I'm done, I'm going to spread it around here. I got and the only one with a tan, too. Yeah, so, I came, back, yeah. <laughs> came back from Mexico. You lucky school teacher. Oh, I'm sorry, that wasn't a nice thing to say. And I'm Mary Lynn Donahue. I'm a humble city lawyer. Um, and our a hugger at night. I <laughs> our special guest uh, today is uh, Alderman Juan Perez, now Mayor-elect Juan Perez. We're delighted that you've uh, joined us. I think we're your first uh, television program as Mayor-elect. And may you come back many other times, but we have tons of questions for you and welcome. I'm sure you will. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's always a pleasure to be in a, in a position to be able to talk to the community as we're doing today. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. Well, very good. Um, great victory last night, 54% uh, to 46%. Correct. Ken has lots of statistics for us at, at a certain point, but tell us how you're feeling. Tired. <laughs> <laughs> Tired first, very happy second. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm actually more pleased with the community in general because I think the community made a statement last night that they want their government back. They want their government to be responsive to, to their needs. And I think the people took a huge step in that direction last night. And that's what I'm most happy about, uh, mm. about the election. Um, and we'll all feel free to chime in with questions, but uh, uh, it was certainly a spirited campaign, a um, couple of press conferences that you held. Uh, those of us who lived in the city got lots of literature in the mail and dropped at the doors, and some of us even had phone calls and so forth. From your perspective, what were the issues that were the most important to your campaign? Well, there were several issues, but one issue seemed to surface the most, and that was the Sheridan Park issue mm -hmm. when the council made a decision to destroy a, a park, a historic park in my mind, and one of our most important parks at, uh, that's in central, uh, central Sheboygan. When the council made that decision, I think the people realized that the council was not going to be responsive to their pleas, but the, the, the Sheridan Park issue actually it was not a, a one-issue campaign type of thing. It was. It, the Sheridan Park issue embodied a lot of what's wrong with, with City Council now and, and City Hall. For example, it reflected on how the Council and City Hall were not being responsive to the people, not listening when we had 3,000 signatures, 3,000 plus signatures come in and ask just simply for a referendum and they refused to do that. And it also reflected on how the City Council is not fiscally responsible before they could even read and evaluate a, a second study on, on Sheridan Park. They went ahead and spent a lot of money and contracted a, a, an architect for over half a million dollars. So it reflected a lot on their fiscal responsibility, or should I say lack of. And it also reflected on their, on their uh, lack of, of seriousness and focusing on shared services also, because Sheridan Park, as we know, there's a second report that says it's, it will not provide for optimum shared services and yet they, they kept insisting that they were going to build it there. So it reflected a lot of their unwillingness to, to, to uh, support shared services. So all those three, at least those three main issues, were embodied in the Sheridan Park issue. And then mm -hmm. the final one is you don't take away parks from the people. Yeah. The parks are, are for the people and they're in perpetuity and they remain for, for future generations to enjoy. So that's pretty much how it uh, boiled up. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. Um, did you um, see any, and folks just feel free to chime in with questions, but did you see any particular pockets of strength in your campaign, or was it more broad-based? Uh... Well, at times people said the park people are on your side, but I, I think that it was a very broad base. You know, I think you, you see that and reflected in the, uh, the way the wards came out. Uh, I, I, took all, I took several wards in terms of higher votes. So it reflected the, the, the general attitude and the sentiment of the community. I think a lot of the people, whether you live near Sheridan Park or not, were just bothered at how dare you take our park. 
And is that, if that's the park you're going to take now, which one will you take later? Because it'll become so easy to do. You know, I heard another word just by talking with people, and you probably said it in so many words, that the council was arrogant. They just tended to I, shun the, the and, community. And there was that sense of arrogance because what, what people did to me was extraordinary. For the longest time we've heard about political apathy. People just don't want to get involved. They don't care. They don't think that they matter. When they found out that the park was going to be destroyed to put a police station, they actually went out and organized and collected all these signatures within a two-month period. So political apathy was no longer there. They wanted to be a part of the decision-making process. And that was extraordinary. But what was more extraordinary is for the council to file a, a, a resolution calling for a referendum to let the people decide. And, and that was filed on the council floor without going to any committee at all. So mm -hmm. that demonstrated that arrogance that you're talking about. Instead of saying thank you to the people for finally getting involved in our process, they said, how dare you? How dare you get involved? And they threw it in the garbage. <laughs> so that was very disturbing to me. And I think it was disturbing to the people, and they proved it last night. They just didn't get it, I they, think is a good way to put it. And I think uh, the letters to the editor and other communications that were out there just showed that the people were saying, you know, if this were the only property in a whole community where you could build something on, it would be different. But they were suggesting you know, the Rice Building and the Century Store and on the North 23rd Street. You could just see the sense of the people saying, I drive around this city, I know this city, there are other options that ought to be looked at. And don't tell me that this is, has to be. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, yeah, arrogance, but just didn't get that the people were really serious about this matter. And they, they numbered, I think, greater than what some of the minority, they portrayed it as a minority of the population. Right. But there was a greater percentage of people out there who were really concerned, and they just didn't read that, not mm -hmm. read it at well, that, all. That's pretty good accurate reading. Well, how critical was the Moose study in terms of your campaign, do you think? Well, we're going to find out how really critical it is because we're going to have a second run at it to, to, to compare both studies, the Kimmy Report and the, uh, I don't call it, it's the independent study, the, the Moyer study for, mm -hmm. uh, for a better term. Uh, but it's going to play a key role because what that report does, it points out that, first of all, Sheridan Park is too small and it doesn't provide for optimum shared services and it's going to cost, the Sheridan Park, Park is going to cost, the site is going to cost us $3 million more. And we're also going to build a police station in a small park. It's going to become obsolete in two, three years after we build it. There's no room for growth, and there's no room for expansion in, in terms of the neighborhood. So where are you going to go? Are you going to start destroying homes, or limited parking, inv invading the area of the school district? It, it's going to cause a lot of problems. So the, that report is going to be critical. I want to get back a little bit to this whole issue of... Uh of people not listening on the council level. Is that a function of, because you were there through all of that, was that a function of uh, those who've been there a little too long versus the newcomers and newcomers being more open? Or why, why, that, uh, why that unwillingness to put it up to a referendum or a willingness to kind of, why the rush, sense of rush to judgment uh, at that time? Well, I have, I have my personal theories, but I think one of them is that and it has a lot to do with somebody being entrenched politically, but it also has a lot to do with somebody saying, I have the vote, I have the power, I can do what I want. And what I've said along the, all along the election is, you need to say what you're going to say before the election and keep saying it after. A lot of people will tell you anything they want, you want to hear just to get elected. And after that, they forget. And two years later, they start telling it to you again, and then they forget again. So you have to be consistent before you get elected and after you get elected, and that's where you're going to be held accountable. That shows your character and integrity. Well, building on that, it's the morning after, <laughs> the afternoon after. What are your thoughts about uh, what's next? What's next is I need to get, meet with the mayor and find out how we can create this smooth transition that we need to create. There's a lot of uh, groundwork that's got to be done. There's committees that need to be appointed. There's people that need to be considered. Uh, one of the things that I'm going to put uh, on fast track is a budget prioritization program that I've been talking about. We're going to go out there into the community, into every department, talk to every employee, and every employee's uh, input will be given equal weight. It doesn't matter if you're here or here. Everybody's going to have a say-so. And I think we're going to get some very interesting ideas, very good cost-saving ideas. I think the money is there. It just hasn't been allocated correctly. So I don't know that we need to generate more revenue. I don't, need, I don't know that we need to go and tax people anymore, create any more fees. I think the money is there. We just need to rearrange it, reallocate it. And we, we'll do that based on the results of the uh, budget prioritization. Have, on, a, on a 
day-to-day op -day operation kind of basis, have you thought about who might be your uh, secretary or uh, what, assistant? Or? My administrative assistant? assistant? Yeah. Actually, <laughs> I have not. Oh, okay. I have not given that any thought because that's been probably the least in, in least my of mind you. right sure, now. But sure. I think the first thing I need to do is how willing is the individual is there now, willing to cooperate and, and carry out the, the, uh, the work that I need done. Uh, that's going to take a, a, a meeting with the individual, sit down okay. and talk and see where things are going to go from there. I want to be as fair as I can to, to that individual so that uh, we're, on, we're on good terms. If people are interested in serving on commissions and committees uh, in the city, because uh, there's a, a process where they get appointed, mm -hmm. uh, are you going to be uh, soliciting uh, uh, appointment? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, that's a good question, Tom. What, we're, what I plan to do is actually put out an announcement in, in the Sheboygan Press and WHBL and ask pe list the, the committees that are going to be available and ask people to, to uh, chime in and see if they want to participate in it. And once they call in, not only will they say, well, I want to be a part of the X committee, we'll be able to tell them, this is X committee, and these are some of the responsibilities that will be expected of you if you're willing to, uh -huh. to do it. Uh -huh. um, that'll, again, it'll, that'll tie in with my community involvement, getting, engaging the community in critical decision making that I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people aren't even looking. We've got some good people out there in the community that, that can be great contributors to our, our government. They haven't been reached out to, and that's what we need to do. Yeah, we need to reach true. out to them and say, you are welcome. You're a key critical part of, my, of the government here and my administration. I need your help. Do you want to help? Yeah. Now, if they say no, it's another issue, yeah, but uh, yeah. at least you extend your hand out there to okay. people. Yeah. I think that's true of the, the employees, too. I think we underestimate oftentimes people who do the job day to day and what they have to offer to make their job more efficient and run the department that they work in. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised sometimes what creative ideas and how helpful they can be and how once you empower them, how participatory exactly. they want to be. Absolutely. And it's pretty interesting because when I started talking about this budget prioritization process or plan that I'm going to put in place, people started already calling with ideas and sending little anonymous letters and look into this, look into that, try this, try that. It, yeah. it, it catches on. People really want to help. They sure. want to be contributors. They want to be, they want to be listened to. They want to be respected. They want to be treated fairly. They want to be a part of us. We just haven't let them yet. Yeah. This is what I want to do. I want to let the people be a part of us. Yeah. There's a, a not only the the change in the in the top leader uh, in the city, but a, really a, a sea change in the in the common council. Lots of new faces, and and um, those of us who are watching the election returns last night were frankly a little astonished mm -hmm. by the uh, the winners and the losers uh, on, on the council. With a lot of new people on board, um, how do you think? What kind of relationship do you see developing with, with new older people, and, and how is all that going to work out for you? Well, there's obviously going to be a little bit of resistance. There was a, as you all know, there was a majority there in the council at times, a pretty uh, distinct split. But I, I think most of the aldermen are willing to work together towards a common goal. If you're able to present them with a plan that makes sense, that, that's workable, that's doable. I think if, if and you explain it to them, if they're able to buy into something, I think they're willing. To, they, they would be willing to work. There may be one or two that don't, and that's okay too. We're just going to move on. But we need to get enough people on board to say this is this is where we're going, folks. We're here, and this is where we're going to end up. I need your help to help me get there, and I think a lot of them will buy into that. Well, I think the message of change uh, was shown by the the victors. So I think those who who might be reluctant to be participatory are going to see have evidence that they ought to be. <laughs> exactly. I think that's called writing on the wall that's or right. writing in the voting booth. Uh, when I was on the council and Dick Susha was mayor and then Dick Schneider ran against him and won and there was a majority of the council who favored Dick Susha and of course they face, we faced that same kind of situation. We got a new mayor and we were pro susha and how do we, we were going to react it it worked its way out over time but not initially there, there's a there's a little uh, but, uh, but to get to where uh, Cal was from I mean you know without making Juan's case for him here but this is a pretty this is a pretty strong victory 54 percent of the vote I'm looking at the three um, if you want to call them challengers susha Meyer and Radke uh, when you look at their aldermanic districts, Juan got more votes than they did. Um, and so you start wondering about, you know, coattail effects. And uh, he was really very close to the Kittleson in the third. And uh, actually, 
you know, the only ones where Juan really didn't do as well was, you know, you had two unopposed, you know, Montemayor uh, was running unopposed, Davis was running unopposed, uh, even Alderman Berg in, in the first uh, district, you had 973, if I did my adding real quickly here, and you had 986. So I, I guess the question I want to ask you, Tom, is, I mean, when you start seeing a mayor, a mayor elect come into office with that kind of strength and got more votes than you did in your own, don't you pay attention to that? You have built-in biases from the, the day before the election, let's put it that way. You are campaigning for your candidate, working for your candidate, and, uh, you're, and you just come with a built-in bias. You, uh, it shouldn't have happened that way. Well, and I will say that when we, um, all of us who have run for school board or, or other elections, um, it is gratifying to come in as the front runner or the, the top vote getter. But once you're sworn in and you're voting, that doesn't make any difference. And trust <coughs> me, nobody remembers that you got you know, that much more of the vote than, than somebody else. So I think. To, but you're one of you're one of X number in a board, and everybody gets one vote. No, right. You know, exactly. Sure. In Sheboygan, we don't have a particularly strong mayoral system, but mm -hmm. but still. Yeah. And, and I'm just thinking about the coalitions and everything. You know, your old seat kind of really kind of comes kind of important. I don't know. You've been so busy probably running for mayor, you haven't thought about it, but. Machiavelli types like me do. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Who's going to be the? <laughs> I mean, that seat Italy is kind of important. You've got three people that you suspect will be coming in and more or less agreeing with you on most issues. You hope. You know. So oh, yeah, my my position obviously is going to be very very critical, um, and I'm very cognizant of the fact that ten aldermen endorsed Fram publicly. Now, does that mean that uh, they will not work with me? I don't think so. I think they endorsed him because at that time they just felt that, that, that they wanted to be loyal to him and they, hey, he had a good chance of winning. Um, that's, hum that's human nature. Human nature tends to do that to you. But I think well, now it's definitive. Now they know he didn't win. There's a new mayor. So I think some of those sentiments will change. And um, hopefully we'll be able to get somebody in, in, to replace me in my district that, uh, that will be an independent thinker and, and a thinker. Uh, with, the, with the council. Are you hearing anything about who might be interested? Not at all. I don't think anybody, many or many people are thinking about it because a lot of people don't even realize that I have to resign my position to to be mayor. Uh, people haven't thought about it, uh, but it's going to hit pretty soon. It will. Yeah. It will. And of course it's going to change some of the politics, uh, well, I don't know, politics, but it's going to change things around a little bit on the school board as well because a new president will have to be chosen. Well, I think I created a, maybe a mess there because i got to be replaced in the council and the school board, so now there's two <laughs> positions I have to be replaced in. And at the here at the university <laughs> as well. <laughs> and the university, so that's three of them. Well, that was interesting. You're getting jobs right off the bat. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. High paying jobs. You university campaigning for you. Now, did that mean they wanted you to win yeah. so you wouldn't be here? <laughs> <laughs> or because you were so good here that we got that way. We got Actually, away. it's because I was Maybe so that's why you got so much teacher support. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, but it is interesting to, I mean, the, so many more people are willing to be um, appointed to a position rather than to have, than to actually have to run for it. Yes. And so we often find, uh, or did find it with school board um, positions that a, a vast well, not vast number, but a substantial number of people would apply for for an open candidacy, and the same things happen in the at, at least if they all said because that gives them a year in as an incumbent for a year, and it gives them a little bit of the background and so forth. But running for office, and again, depending on which office it is, can be brutal sometimes, and it can wear, wear you down. Yeah. Um, there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of pressure on on a candidate. You know, I want to try to. We had another election out there, and it seemed like it should have the the town of Sheboygan chairman. Mm -hmm. And with the Walmart uh, decision, the big hullabaloo about why did they approve the Walmart app, you know, uh, application, et cetera, et cetera. The town of Sheboygan chairman won. And there was a big outcry, and everybody thought maybe the town of Sheboygan chairman would lose, mm -hmm. just like Sheridan. So Sheridan was a big outcry. So it wasn't more than Sheridan that, uh, you know, because you just had this little single event, the town of uh, yeah. Sheboygan uh, but, Walmart you know, decision, and they yeah. still won. But the thing that happened with Sheridan Park, that was, and, and I think I've shared it before, is that when my 83-year-old mother-in-law will circulate a petition, not only sign one, but actually circulate a petition to change the decision on Sheridan Park, that's pretty broad-based broad. and pretty grassroots. But and just because our time runs quicker than we than we think, you talked about campaigning being a fairly brutal process, and those of us who have campaigned for things, everyone but you, I think, <laughs> um, can attest to that. 
Um, behind the scenes kind of guy. There you go. Um, so he looks so I'm not electable. That's yeah. <laughs> I'm just not electable. That's yeah, just the plain no, fact of the matter. Well, we, 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 we know that. Yeah. But um, how's your family doing? Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful family. We didn't hear much about them in the election. Sylvia is still uh, walking and talking. And oh, she's still walking and talking to me, I should say. <laughs> no, she's doing real well. My kids are handle themselves really well. I, You've I, got three boys? Three boys. Um, one lives in Madison and two live here in Sheboygan. And we have a first grandson who learned to walk about three weeks ago and hadn't stopped since. And he learned to say his first word, mayor. <laughs> now, did, you have, did, you have, did you have the grandson Said leafleting? Now they, did you have the grandson leafleting now that he's walking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So he said his first word. That well, was awesome. No, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it can be very difficult for families, for, for spouses, and for children uh, because the pressures, you're in a, in a goldfish bowl essentially, and, um, uh, or a fish bowl <laughs> of any kind. Uh, and it can be unpleasant mm. at times. Uh, well, I think, as you know, uh, there's no, no secret anymore at times that this mayoral election had a tendency to go into the ugly part, the negative part. Um, I'm glad that it really didn't, but it was, it was attempted, and I stayed my course. I remained steadfast with my promise to the people that I was going to keep it clean, and I did, and my campaign committee did too, and I think the people responded to that too. Yeah, exactly. We don't want to strip the mayoral election of its integrity and honor and you do that when you get dirty and fight any way you can to win I don't think that's the most important thing the most important thing is to maintain that integrity and honor in that office because when it's all over and done and smoke is gone that office has to shine and well and of course we're all the the victims of nasty unpleasant dishonest untruthful not helpful political campaigns where television ads are, are the mm -hmm. decide issues that certainly shouldn't be decided. But it seems to me that one of the new campaign tools just in recent years, particularly in the April nonpartisan elections, are letters to the editor. Mm -hmm. uh, that's new to me. I mean, there yeah, were always... Normally, in the past, they usually cut those off because they didn't want uh, sort of the people stacking the mailbox one way or the other. But I think by opening it up, it, it, it allowed people a, an avenue of expression that they hadn't had before. And it was a pretty pretty wide yeah, range back and forth so and there's something else happened there I thought was extraordinary with the park and again as I said the park embodied a lot of the issues and concerns citizens have but the press the Sheboygan press itself did about the unprecedented four editorials on just that issue yeah. itself mm -hmm. which they've never done before yeah. so it was extraordinary from on, from yeah. their part to to be able to go out on a limb and say the council is wrong the council needs to reverse its decision yeah. I think there was a unique perception uh, on the part of the incumbents in many cases saying that they made a difficult decision, they were statesmen, but in actuality that wasn't the case. There are cases where you do have to make difficult decisions, but this was just a wrong decision. <laughs> <laughs> a wrong, difficult decision. <laughs> and sometimes you have to admit that. We all make mistakes. And, and uh, I was surprised in a way by the fact that when you had this new report, it was really an, another open door. For many of those people say, yeah, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe we ought to not t put this uh, off in the committee or off to the side. Let's mm -hmm. take it up. Let's see if we can save money. Let's see if we can have a different course. But again, enough people didn't get it. And it, it, you, got, you got it, apparently, and <laughs> obviously, and uh, you, you ran with it. Mm -hmm. Let me ask one more about finances. Did you have a sense you were winning or winning the discussion amongst the people? Uh, did people call you and say, I'd like to make a contribution to your campaign? Or oh. as that sort of way as you know, as you're moving through the campaign from, you know, January to February to March, did you feel that there were Actually, yes. It was uh, it was quite complimentary. Uh, when I ran for school board both times and even Alderman for school board when I ran the last time, and I think the time before that I, I came in with about sixty seven hundred votes. Not once. Not once did anybody call and say, How can I help? Not once did anybody knock on my door and say, how can I help, here's a check, or I want to sign. Not once. This time was extraordinary. I must have had hundreds of people call me. There, I mean, there was a pattern at one time, it was five calls a day for signs, and then it got down to at least two a day, and I was getting calls for signs a day before the election. That's how, that's how yeah, people, so people were encouraging. It was just awesome. And the phone calls a day after the election, which is today, were just phenomenal. It started, my phone started ringing at 6 o'clock, so... 
all congratulatory. I haven't gotten a bad one yet. <laughs> <laughs> You're uh, sworn in on April 18th. I believe I believe so. Yes. Um, give us, um, if you can, this is a little tough, and we're coming down to our last minutes. Uh, three month, six month, one year. Where do you think you'll be? Uh, in terms of accomplishing what you're looking to do in those time frames? Well, I know that we can break it in those in those segments, uh, Marilyn. I think it's going to take it's going to take at least uh, a year to put everything in place, and maybe another year to get it to work. And that's being realistic because there's mm -hmm. a lot of work that needs to be done, moods and attitudes that need to be worked on, and it'll, it'll take about a year. Given that you and the police chief are kind of apart on this police on the uh, department issue, how does that going to play out? How do you work? How do you work with someone who's diametrically opposed, it seems, at least on this one issue? Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot of talking. We're going to be meeting quite a bit, okay. and uh, we'll see where that takes us. And I think a reminder that uh, when you're elected, it's different than someone who's in an appointed position. And I think that that's oftentimes you have to bring that forth to the people who are appointed, that when you're an elected person, you behave differently oftentimes, you look at things differently, mm -hmm. because you have a, a lot of bosses. Mm -hmm. Whereas an appointed person may have just a few bosses. Exactly, and an appointed person really does not, it's not, it's not in his, his or her mind to, to represent the interests of the people. They represent the interests of the department. Yeah. Elected officials have to represent the interests of the people, right. and they can't forget that. They that's can right. never forget it's that. When they do, different. that's when they get in trouble. Yeah. That's right. I know we're getting really close to the end here, but given how the Sheridan Park issue played out and its importance in your campaign one, how is the ethanol situation going to have to play out for you, or how do you how do you going to approach that in your mind as you have another concern, almost a similar community, it's just a couple mm -hmm. blocks away, uh, concerned community about that issue? Well, the way the way it will play out is the process that we're going to put in place, and that's what a lot of what went wrong with the Sheridan Park uh, mm -hmm. issue. The process was not there. There was there was no fairness in how they handled the situation. There was never community input. There was no listening to the people. We need to put a process in place where everybody knows what to expect. Here's what we got. Now we make a decision. People are, people want to be involved. We just never reached out and gotten people involved. And that's what I intend to do in critical decisions. Sounds good. Sounds, Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. So, well, we wish you the uh, very best in your Thank you. new endeavor. And uh, this is uh, a big new opportunity for you and uh, so we think that it'll be terrific and and uh, Godspeed. I, I look forward to it. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank you for having me. Congratulations. 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 Thank you.